questions. Nick, please. Great. Good, Sophia. And uh, uh, welcome to the, uh, the second of our lockdown learning sessions. Um, for, for those of you that joined the, uh, the first one, welcome back. Um, you'll, you'll remember if you did join that first one that we, we touched on uh, mental health and mental well-being uh, at the end of that session. And a lot of the feedback that came from uh, the post-webinar survey was that they'd like to know more about, uh, more about that and what they can be doing to uh, improve their own mental well-being. Uh, but also help colleagues that might be going through you know, similar scenarios. So um, it is, uh, it's fantastic to have Azran uh, Osman Rani join us this morning from, uh, from Neuralink. Um, Azran, we've shared the, the physical stage once before, but this is a first for us uh, on the digital stage, the digital platform. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this morning's conversation to, uh, uh, to hear what you have to say, but also to maybe debunk and uh, go through some pretty thought-provoking uh, topics. Um, sure. Look, uh, I've got a question for you first and foremost. Um, yeah. You've had a really, really interesting career. You've done lots yeah. of different things, um, yeah. from Area Direct to management consulting to, to iFlix. Why the change into, uh, in, into this area? Okay, well, so first of all, it might seem like it's a uh, you know, random collection of different industries, but there's always been one common theme across all of them. What fascinates me is looking at existing business models and figuring out how can we make it 10 times more accessible to the mass market? How do we make it 10 times more affordable and more convenient at the same time? So whether it's long haul travel or looking at cable and satellite TV and saying, can digital make that you know, much more accessible and much more affordable to now healthcare? And of course, healthcare is deeply personal for me. Uh, you know, uh, you know I, I went through my journey from uh, once upon a time, long ago, I, I was an overweight person, diabetic and hypertensive, to being an Ironman triathlete like yourself. So, uh, you know, I'd love to find a way to share that experience with more people. Great stuff. And um, where, does the, uh, uh, where does the name come from? Give me a little bit of, uh, of uh, a background behind that. Okay, well, Naluri, uh, whether in Bahasa Indonesia or Bahasa Malaysia, means instinct or intuition. And if we're really gonna affect change, the message here is it's not about what you consciously think about, but you gotta make it part of your subconscious, part of your routines and automatic habits. So part of your naluri. Interesting, interesting. Now, one of the things I did want to, uh, to talk about today is, um, again, it's kind of debunking this myth around you know, healthy body, healthy mind. And it's something that I've spoken about an awful lot. Uh, and I've been very guilty of um, driving purely a healthy body agenda, whether it be through run club, badminton, or whatever it may be through, through the workplace. Um, but there's obviously a bit of a difference because if you want a healthy body, you go to the, you know, running, you go to the gym or whatever it may be. Um, but that doesn't necessarily lead to a healthy mind. Um, and I'm really interested to hear how we can maybe tie the two, but also try and focus on mental fitness as Absolutely. well. Because That's there right. is this stigma um, and prejudice around maybe a lack of education with, with mental yeah. health. And how can we change that rhetoric to mental fitness and, yeah. and, and, and not be such a, um, a taboo subject to, uh, to talk about? So, uh, so I'm really hoping some of the, uh, the presentation touches on that and, uh, and we can get some, some, some key takeaways. Um, okay, so look, before I hand over to you to, uh, to go through your, your slides, um, Sophia, can we, can we run the first poll, please? Sure, Nick. So for every one of you here on the call today, we have a poll that we'd like to... to have you participate in? So the question is, as many organizations start planning for or going back to the workplace, how are your current stress and anxiety levels? Is it higher than pre-COVID-19? About the same? You're actually quite relaxed or it changes often. So let us know by casting your vote and then we'll be able to share the results live as well. We have, you know, people dialing in from all over Asia today, a very diverse crowd. And obviously with that, that also does mean that a lot of us are at various stages of recovery or planning for recovery. So I think it's, it's quite interesting hearing from such a diverse audience about what your current stress levels are. So for those of you who have voted, thank you. I'll just leave it running for five more seconds for, to capture any last votes and then we can share the results from there. The, un the answers are actually pretty interesting. So let yeah. me just end that now and then share that with everyone here. So it seems, oh, yeah, a, a pretty even split, I would say. Um, but majority of you, 33% say you're actually, you know, feeling about the same in terms of stress and anxiety. 
Um, and then 27% of you have it higher than pre-COVID. So I guess that's why we're all here today um, to hear how we can manage that a bit better. What do you guys think, Azran? Nick? Well, I think what's interesting for me is that option about it changes often. Because, you know, as humans, we respond to triggers around us. The environment affects how we feel, how, what we believe, the thoughts that we uh, focus. It's not about just one feeling necessarily, but it changes often. I, I relate most to that option. Yeah, likewise. And I think as we, we touched on, on earlier, um, I think it's really important to, to understand and, and appreciate that everyone is different. Um, and certainly as, as, as leaders, um, it's really important that we don't you know, cast judgment on anyone if they're feeling very, very nervous or if someone's actually quite relaxed about it because um, everyone's scenario is different. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that, that the results were like that. So uh, really, really interesting. Um, Azran, I'm going to hand over to you to, uh, to go through your slides. I'm really excited. Thank you. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, to start with, I want to first share with you a little bit about my personal journey, my professional career. While there's a lot, I'm going to give you a little snapshot. And the one common theme is nothing ever goes according to plan. So really, the alternative title to this presentation should be how Azran loses all his hair, because things just uh, keep ripping them apart because, you know, uh, never go according to plan. So, um, hold on, let me see. What can I do? Oops. Okay. So, you know, when I first started an airline in 2007, right, soon after we started an airline, if you guys remember 2008, a few months later, there was the global financial crisis where all the banks who even had signed loan agreements for aircraft financing all pulled out. Right, suddenly we're completely stuck with no financing options, very similar to what a lot of our uh, companies are going through right now. And in that same period, uh, commodity prices went completely haywire. And here's the thing, right? When oil prices, for example, started to surge, we started the year in 2008 at $75 a barrel, and then it started climbing to 80, 90, $100 a barrel. And a lot of people freaked out, and what they did was they asked for advice. Well, the problem is, you know, lesson number one, be careful when you listen to bankers, because bankers basically say, oh, hedge your fuel prices, right? Lock it in. And that's what a lot of airlines did. And so they would lock the price of fuel at that prevailing $100 a barrel price for the next 12 months, thinking, phew, I've mitigated that risk, because that's what you were told to do. And oil prices continued to go up to 110, 20, 30. By July of 2008, barely six months out into the year, it went to $142 a barrel. Now you think, wow, as a young CEO, I was like, I'm the smartest person to be able to lock it at $100 when the spot price is $140. I thought I was king of the world because the accountant said I could actually book the profits of that spread. Guess what happened six months later? By December 2008, it went all the way down to $32 a barrel. Right, and everyone who had locked those prices essentially was in deep, deep trouble. 50 airlines went bust. So, so much for risk mitigation, um, according to what people tell you to do. And even after that, we thought, was that it? Was it just a single year? Every single year after that's one thing after the other. From the Icelandic volcanic eruption, you might remember that it shut down the entire European airspace just when we started flying to London. And three months after flying to Japan in 2011, Boom, the Tohoku tsunami, earthquake, nuclear disaster, and pilots afraid to fly, and some passengers said, you really must continue to fly. The year after that, you know, we started flying to Christchurch, New Zealand. Not one, but two big earthquakes welcomed us to that beautiful country. But, you know, at the same time, we had to deal with a very complex government and policy and regulatory environment, right? We were blocked from certain market access and you know you can take a view that well it is what it is or figure out how do we get around a very complex and fast changing um, regulatory environment but the toughest year for me was 2014 because in that year we didn't have one two we had three black swan events the mh17 plane that disappeared mh370 that got shot down in july and by december qz8501 a plane unfortunately went down right and while those were not my airlines it affected global or travel demand to malaysia uh, in that one year right and it took a really really big beating and every single industry i've been in this has been a common theme nothing goes according to plan and by the way even in my personal life right 
again, you might be cycling one day down the road. Nick and I are, are, are triathletes cycling and boom, a car comes from behind at very fast speeds and knocked me down. And, and that left me with some uh, brain uh, injuries, uh, spinal injuries, three of my four limbs were in a cast. I couldn't even scratch my nose lying in bed. Uh, you know, so a, a lot of difficulties and, and pain and, and, and broken bones. And the thing that got me to realize is we can't go through life avoiding risks. It's not about avoiding risk because life is going to throw you um, all these things and it's going to smack you down hard. But what we've got to learn personally as an organization is how do we get back up? And that was the message that I had to keep building into myself so that one month after that accident, I said, look, I got to get back up. I got to start walking, even if it meant painful five minute walks. But eventually, when you start somewhere, it starts to build. Day 47, I could pick up the pace and start running on the treadmill. Day 62, I was so excited to be able to run outdoors as I was for those of you who are in Malaysia the last few weeks when we were finally allowed to run outdoors. But day 84 was very, very emotional because I could get back on my bicycle, new bicycle, um, and, and ride with my friends uh, again. But day 112 was when I could regain the mobility from my shoulder that was broken and I could start swimming because what I really wanted to do is to be able to go back to racing. And less than six months from that accident, day 174, I went back to the island of Langkawi to race Ironman 70.3 to be able to really hone into myself, to my family, to my team members that, you know, we can't control what happens to us, but we can absolutely control what we do with, with the cards that we're dealt with, right? You can choose to be a victim or you can choose to get back up and move ahead again. So I want to start this context first by talking about the, the choice that happens oftentimes is not a conscious decision because our brains at any one time receives tens of millions of input signals, thoughts going around, and it can only process 10. It filters out so many things. And the way it filters it out is based on what you're familiar with. So for example, how many people in the audience are interview candidates to join your team, right? So if you can put up your hands, if you interview your candidates to join your team, guess what? While you might go through a whole hour interviewing a candidate and asking all kinds of different assessments, maybe with the advice of Michael Page, but actually for most of us, um, in the first 10 seconds of meeting that candidate, oftentimes before that candidate has even said a single word, we've already subconsciously made a decision. And the brain starts to filter everything that goes against that gut feeling and only retains information that confirms your bias. And so we're full of biases because that's the only way the brain can make sense of all the different inputs that surround us. And we also have to be very careful about past successes because they create the biggest biases. So for example, some of my past experiences, right? Uh, working with AirAsia as a brand, many people think this is a dynamic, innovative, risk-taking airline, but still once it became successful, it too became very fixed in what it believed was possible or not possible in the low cost airline industry. And it took a lot to really change those fixed beliefs. Another former employee of mine, Astro, right? Had been very, very successful as a satellite TV broadcaster for 20 years. Uh, so dominant. And then suddenly over the last few years, as you can see, people realize, why do we even need set-top boxes anymore? Because our phones have far more computing power than these boxes. Why do we even need channels anymore that tell us when our TV programs are going to come on air? Because today we should be able to watch whenever we want, wherever we want. We don't need installers and we don't need boxes. But still today they're selling boxes and channels because if you've been doing things for 20 years, it's really, really hard to change. More so in a climate when there's a lot of uncertainty because uncertainty creates stress. Now stress actually is something necessary for survival. Stress gets us ready to confront threats. Now in ancient times, our ancestors, you know, had to deal with real predators like a lion chasing after you, right? And when a lion chases after you, stress hormones get triggered, your heart starts to beat faster, your blood pressure rises, your lungs expand, your muscles get pumped up, prime, ready to outspread a lion. And so for any of you who've ever or will have to deal with a lion chasing after you, just keep this in mind. You only need to outsprint the lion for 30 seconds. If you can outsprint the lion for 30 seconds, you're good. Because most of the time, the lion gives up after 30 seconds because the lion's going to be out of breath. And what's interesting with these antelopes, for example, right? Once the lion gives up, the lion may still be within sight 50 meters away, but immediately those antelopes and gazelles, the stress hormones can just go away and they can start grazing again, even when the lion's at the corner of their eye. 
But humans, unfortunately, we've evolved. Today, we no longer have lions chasing after us, hopefully, but the equivalent is our boss is getting angry, our shareholders getting upset, our clients are upset, our spouses, our children are creating the same stress triggers as if a lion is chasing after us. But we've evolved to the point where we cannot let the stress triggers uh, dissipate by itself to the point where we've evolved into something called anxiety. Anxiety is basically when we start to experience these stress hormones before the threat has materialized. So before the boss is upset or the client is upset or our spouse is upset, we're already worried about a future threat and that already causes us to be in this state of a trigger. Now depression in a way, a simple way of thinking about it is that threat has gone. It's gone in the past, but we can't let go of it. And for some of us, childhood trauma or things from years ago, those videos keep playing in our heads over and over and over again. And it really impacts our ability to perform at our best because our thoughts are just running back and forth between past uh, threats and future potential threats, right? And it just consumes our entire life. Just to give you a flavor for this, so for example, when Nick and I compete in a triathlon, in one day of swimming, cycling, and running, we burn 6,000 calories. 6,000 calories in one day. Like I can lose a few kilos from just one day of racing. But a world champion chess grandmaster competing in a world championship tournament burns 6,000 calories. That's right. You don't need to exercise, guys. Just play chess. But it's, of course, not the moving of the chess pieces, but these guys are running so many thought patterns, permutations, multiple scenarios. The brain is on overdrive. The brain burns so much energy. It consumes calories because it's only 2% of our body weight, but the brain consumes 20% of our energy. And so when we've got a lot of our thoughts in our heads, that's where we become physically fatigued. And when stress is out of control, that fatigue eventually builds up into high blood pressure. It builds up into diabetes. It can even affect or trigger cancer, right? So a lot of these physical disease can manifest when we, we have overwhelming feelings of stress, anxiety, and depression, right? And that is why in a, in a difficult situation, we know that, you know, when, when, when things are very uncertain right now, how do we take, take control of levels of stress, anxiety, and depression in ourselves and in our team members? And coming from the airline industry, I love this example, right? When you start the flight, right? Uh, I'll get to that question. But basically, the first thing you do is you got to take care of yourself. When the flight attendant says, when those oxygen masks come down, you must put it on yourself first before taking care of your loved ones, even before putting it on your children next to you. And this might seem counterintuitive, but a lot of science shows if you try to take care of your, your kids first before yourself, you're going to be ineffective. And so we've got to, as leaders, take care of ourselves first. Right, Because if we um, can't deal with that stress, we're staying up in the middle of the night, we're sending up a lot of emails and WhatsApp messages, asking for status updates from our team members, asking for this, that, and they, therefore, that stress gets amplified to the rest of the organization. Right? And so how we deal with our team members can trigger and amplify stress. One quick tip, for example, right? think about using why versus using how. Right? In, a, in a time of stress, when we ask our team members, why did this happen? Right? Because things don't go according to plan, everybody starts to feel small because you start to accuse each other versus saying, okay, something didn't go according to plan. How can we handle this? What do we need to do to avoid this in the future? Focuses the attention, the organizational attention on actions going forward rather than pointing blame about what has already happened. And this is why what we do as leaders, the language we use makes a big difference whether we flatten the stress curve or we amplify the stress curve in our organizations. So when it comes to leading in crisis, three things to, to keep in mind. First, notice I canceled the word calm. You cannot be calm in crisis. When you're on a plane and there's turbulence and you try to tell yourself, just be calm, just be calm, that doesn't work. Because we are heightened, we are biologically triggered for action. And so we can't be calm. Instead, if we realize that when the heart is beating, when the muscles are pumping, we're actually uh, you know, physiologically being ready to take action, right? We've got to be composed and ready for action rather than being calm. But we've got to be conscious of our biases. Instead of just immediately wanting to take action based on our past experiences, how do we become more curious about new possibilities? And lastly, a crisis like this isn't going to go over this month. 
we're looking at probably three to five years of very difficult and challenging environments ahead of us. So do we have the stamina as leaders to keep growing and not burning ourselves out or burning our teams by lighting both sides of the candle? So some quick things to, to think about, right? What is the root cause of anxiety and depression? Here's a thought. When you think about anxiety as the videos playing in your head about a future potential threat and depression as the videos playing in your head about a threat that has already passed, guess what one thing happens very, very frequently? For a normal person, during the day, our brain is thinking about something else 47% of the time instead of the task that we're supposed to do. So right now, for half of you, as you're listening to me speaking, you're checking your emails, you're doing your WhatsApp messages. I can see Sophia trying to do something else, right? You're kind of, the brain is wondering. You're probably thinking, what am I going to have for lunch, right? All those thoughts mean the brain is uh, wandering around. And this is actually the starting point for depression and anxiety. And guess what? One work practice exacerbates or worsens this, which is multitasking right? We're all told, yeah, yeah, we've got to be more productive. We've got to be multitasking. But guess what happens when you multitask? When you try to do three things at once, like listen to us run, check emails, send WhatsApp messages, and write that report, you're actually not doing four things at once. You're doing one thing at a time, but you're switching from one task to the other every five to 10 seconds. And every time you switch, there's a lot more mental energy that gets consumed. And the more we train our brain to switch very rapidly, the brain starts to learn to mind wanders, to start going back to either past thoughts of threats or future thoughts of threats. So we're creating the foundation for stress, anxiety, and depression by simply multitasking, right? And that's why when it comes to mental resilience and fitness, the first thing is, how do I take control of these videos? How do I become more focused and doing one thing at a time, right? And that's why people talk about mindfulness. And there's a lot of science to show that it, you know, it actually quantitatively improves our ability to have focus, to have optimism, and to look at things positively. And mindfulness isn't just like these breathing techniques or meditation. It's about doing whatever we do and focusing on that task. It means when we're having dinner with our families, have dinner with our families, have conversations with our families, instead of checking on our phone or watching TV at the same time, right? When we're running, You've got two options. I can focus on my running, I can focus my breathing, my stride, or you, you can occupy with so many thoughts going around, right? And so when you start to be more deliberate about focus, we get better at focus. And this is what Nick was talking about. There's specific exercises to get better at focus and optimism and resilience. And of course, lastly, sleep, right? Even losing two and a half hours of sleep makes a very, very big impact on our ability to be more focused and, and more structured in the way we control our brains. By the way, there are right types of exercises and there are wrong types of exercises, right? So some people say they exercise regularly, but that's not gonna be great in terms of how do I become more mentally fit from that point of view, but that's a different conversation, right? So to come back to Nick's point about, you know, mental health is not just about the illness or the weakness part, right? Just like strength, physical health, we understand physical health. Physical health is not just, diabetes, heart diseases, and cancer, it's also about the positive aspects of being physically strong, right? It's about having stamina and endurance. It's about being fast. It's about being strong. It's about being flexible. It's about being coordinated. We understand physical health. Likewise, there are equivalents of mental fitness, right? The equivalence of endurance is resilience, meaning how do I keep bouncing back up? How do I keep getting back up whenever I get knocked down? How do I look at things with a glass half full? That can be trained, right? That is not uh, innate, right? How do I develop focus so that when I'm doing my task, I reduce that 47% mind wandering percentage down to something like 20 to 25%, right? How do I become more optimistic? And also how do I connect better with humans? And that is why, for example, if you think about uh, top athletes, right? The difference between an Olympian who wins a gold medal and the guy who comes to number two, it's not that the physical training is different. It's not that the equipment's different. It's that they've got that mental edge to really be able to focus on that last 0.1% that makes a difference between gold or silver. And that's why, right, by understanding stress as a positive state, because we perform at our best when we can look at stress and say, this is getting me ready to perform. Like Usain Bolt cannot run a world championship, world record beating race by himself, 
right? If he's just running by himself, he's not going to come close to the world record. He needs the top level competition racing right next to him. He needs 100,000 people in the stadium cheering. He needs the live broadcast and all of that stress allows him to channel into focus to say, I can run at, at the highest level that I would not be able to if I only ran by myself. But we need to equip ourselves and our team members with the right levels of skills. Because to perform at our best, think about it as this axis, right? If you don't have the skills and the tools and the means to perform, right, you can't work. So if there's no challenge or difficulty, that's when people become bored, they become relaxed. But if there's too much stress and stimulus and they don't have the skills to equip, that's when they become very worried and very anxious. But if you combine the tools, getting them the right skills and, and, and techniques, they can then take the stress and actually be able to perform much, much better than an environment where it's status quo and there's no stress. And so let's, let's think about our brain because uh, how many of you have heard that you have a left side of your brain and a right side of your brain, right? Where you're told left side of the brain is where you do math and the right side of the brain where you do um, uh, creative pursuits, right? You're told that, put up your hand. If you've been told that, guess what? That is not true. <laughs> We're not, we don't have a left side of the brain for math and the right side of the brain uh, for artistic pursuits. We use both sides of the brains for both sets of activity, but there is a difference between the front side of the brain and the back. The front part here, the prefrontal cortex, is when we process things logically, structured, planning. Right? When you're listening to me right now, this is the part of the brain that gets triggered. You're trying to understand what I say and think, how does this apply to me? The back is the limbic system. This is where our subconscious resides, our emotions, our routines, our habits. And guess what? This back part, way more powerful than the part in front. This part in front, that's why willpower and determination only last for about a month, right? If you can't rewire the brain and make it subconscious where it kind of triggers your nullary, not gonna happen. Which is why simply doing a webinar is not gonna get people to change, right? Simply training people to say, let me give you the skills and the knowledge to do it, not gonna happen, right? So for example, in health, when we tell our employees, after they see a doctor, look, your blood pressure is high, your blood sugar is high, you need to do something about it, you're not. Yes, doctor, yes, doctor. But 74% of you will go back home and not make any changes. 93% of you who start a diet will fail to achieve your diet within a year. Gym memberships are full in January. Guess what happens by December? Only 28% of people are left in the gyms. Fitbits, you're so excited with your brand new Fitbit in January, you set up a 10,000 step WhatsApp group, you get every friend and family member involved. But what does sign show? By December, 90% of you have deliberately lost your Fitbits or you're only using it to tell the time. Because it's not about giving people a tool and giving people knowledge and off they go, right? There's a lot of uh, things that need to happen from translating behaviors into something that really changes habits in the long run. Now, while 20% of people can succeed on their own, right, for a lot of people in HR, you know, um, coaching, for example, is a lot more effective than training, right? Specifically, when it comes to behaviors, having a coach work with you side by side increases your probability of success by three times, right? And that's why the Lewis Hamiltons and Usain Bolts and the New Zealand All Blacks have a team of coaches working with them because they create that accountability. They check up on you in progress. They're there to kind of, folk, first of all, create a safe space, right? A lot of problems with our employees who are overwhelmed with stress and anxiety is how do they open up? Because they're afraid of coming up to the bosses because sometimes bosses are the ones that are causing that stress and anxiety. So they don't have a place to open up. But a coach also then, it's not just about the safe space to listen, but then to also say, okay, let's figure out what are we going to do this week? What's the one or two things that we can turn into an action, do something different, and then I'll check in again at the end of the week to see what's working, what's not working, right? And inevitably, any journey, people are going to hit roadblocks. They're, they're going to be setbacks and obstacles. And coaches kind of help you think through this to say, okay, um, if plan A didn't work, what's plan B, right? What can we learn from those mistakes? What are we going to do differently? And that accountability increases our chances for success. And that's why what we try to do is figure out how can we scale this, right? Because how do we take what top athletes have and be able to provide it to as many employees or specifically employees who really need, who are really struggling with behaviors and, and mindset changes, right? And that, so that's what we try to do. And the first thing we do, like with anything, right? You've got to figure out how do we measure it? 
Because if you can't measure it, it's very, very hard to know are you making an improvement or not. And so what we do at Nullery and when we work with our corporate clients is to say, okay, look, let's really assess the state of mental health in an organization. And you can see this. This is very typical. After about almost 10,000 people going through our program, we see about 40% of employees have elevated levels of depression, 60% of elevated levels of anxiety, 30% of elevated levels of stress, and between 8 to 12% of that is very serious, right? It, it's sort of clinical levels. And what's interesting to, to Nick's point is when you also measure physical health, right? Those same people, when you measure weight, blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, the same people who have depression, anxiety, and stress have elevated levels of being overweight, being hypertensive, uh, being uh, diabetic, and, and having high cholesterol at the same time. And so what we try to do then is to figure out if we can profile the risk of employees, Find the bottom 10 to 20% who are really, really struggling and then figure out what are the different interventions that we can provide. How can we really give them the tools and the, the support system to deal with it, right? And so we create multiple different touch points from having a dedicated website, webinars to kind of just great build more awareness using digital coaching, which I'll talk about, or video therapy sessions, or even a 24-7 crisis hotline that's available. Um, and so the thing about um, you know, behavior change is it's not about having one session, right? If you go see a doctor and the doctor spends 30 minutes explaining something to you, you may or may not do anything about it. But if you're constantly having a team of professionals wait, proactively checking up on you over time, you're more likely to be more accountable, right? And, and also, for example, there's times when someone just feels so frustrated I really just need to pick up a phone call and speak to someone who's trained to listen and acknowledge, or in some cases where it becomes really, really serious, how can I have a good access to a proper therapy system to book? But because we create a digital platform, this is where it gets really cool, right? Where we can then start to quantify, right? So with, with digital data, we quantify things like change readiness. And here's interesting, for the first time, many people have never seen before someone going through a 16 week change journey and actually seeing that it's not linear, right? But someone starts by being enthusiastic, they hit a roadblock, their readiness to change drops. So we need to come in, pick them back up again. They're gonna hit another roadblock, boom, that drops and we gotta pick them back up again. And just from analyzing language, right? Using natural language processing, this is an actual case of a 32 year old uh, female executive who for the first two months was just talking about her diet, exercise, what she's doing in the family, and suddenly the words change, the verbs and the adjectives change, and the computer detected a big dip in the emotion sentiment. And when our psychologist saw this, reached out to her, she said, thank you for reaching out to me because my husband's traveling, I've got to take care of the kids at home, they're sick, I've got a lot of pressure from my boss, it's performance appraisal season, I was thinking of ending my life. True story, right? And most of the time, they don't reach out, right? So if you just simply have a phone number, they may not call. But if we can detect these subtle changes early on, we proactively reach out and hopefully be able to intervene at an early stage. And that's why I think we've got to really change how we provide these support and tools beyond just here's a phone call, call if you need help, but a really structured process to, to deliver you know, tangible, meaningful change that we can quantify and measure. So with that, I'm gonna stop, pause, and, and let's bring back the discussion to Nick. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Adran, that, uh, that was great. And I just wanna ask you one question that ties in towards the, uh, the point you made towards the end there, because one of the, um, uh, one of the points that came out the first session we did was um, how, how HR functions can change um, in order to help um, employee wellbeing moving yeah. forward. And part of the answer was, that they, they don't have any key metrics for measuring um, yep. employee wellbeing. Now, some companies are more advanced than others, but generally there hasn't been a structured KPI around employee wellbeing. Um, so with that in mind, you know, how, can, how can coworkers start to, to help identify a, a colleague who may be about to go on a dip or in that dip or at the bottom of the dip? Um, because if they're not talking out themselves, it's really important that, that colleagues can, can try and identify that and help encourage that conversation. Absolutely. So, you know, so one of the things that we do normally is to set up a website because if you just have a webinar or you just say, here's an app that's available. If at that particular point, it's not relevant to me, I'm not going to reach out and engage. Right. But if there's always a site where everyone can go 
either I don't know how I feel, how do I do a private self-assessment so that I have a better understanding of whether what I feel is normal because they're completely normal levels of stress, anxiety, and depression, right? So for me, I'm depressed all the time, but you know, if we usually one very good ice cream and I'm pretty good, right? But for some people, they can't self-regulate because they're biological reasons, psychological reasons, and social reasons. And so that's when they need help. At the same time, we also provide resources for colleagues to know how do I support my colleague, right? So what are the things I see? And if I see them having this, how do I approach them, right? So like a three-step thing, right? Which is first, I need to be in the right frame of mind, right? I need to know when I reach out to help, I may be turned down, all right? They might say, there's nothing wrong with me, right? Or if they open up to me, am I really ready to help, right? And then what are the options I have available, right? How do I listen attentively? How do I avoid being judgmental, right? How do I just tell them, oh, just go, go seek help, right? But third, how do I know when to escalate? So uh, kind of having these checklists available on, on a site that every employee can go and they can feel safe that, you know, they're not being tracked or monitored is one of the things that we can do to kind of broaden the awareness, but doing in a way that's quantifiable so that we can monitor um, at an aggregate level for the organization. Agreed. And I think the, the point you made around that, that mental fitness, I, I really do resonate with because, um, you know, like I said, a lot of people will go to the gym or go to a spa and they may have a, a two hour workout or a, you know, maybe a two, three hour pampering session. And it's very easy to lose yourself in those moments. Yeah. Um, but then once you walk out the door of the gym or the spa or, you know, you, you stop sweating from your, your run, um, sooner or later, you're going to come face to face with, with your inner processes again and the inner you. And, and it's then how do I then recognize that and, and what, what exercises can I be doing? And it might be just a little bit often rather than, you know, one big chunk and then nothing else for 12 months. But what, what can I do to consistently make sure I'm able to self-regulate and know when I do have a, have a problem? Sure. So the, the best way of thinking about this is how do we treat a physical condition like diabetes and how do we treat something like mental health, right? Mm -hmm. So diabetes, for example, we know, oh, I can look at my blood sugar. I may be slightly elevated and the doctor might tell me, well, you know, you've got pre-diabetes. I'm not going to give you any medication, but you really should start to cut your carbs and refine sugars and, and start exercising, right? Once it gets a bit higher, okay, I'm going to start to give you metformin, which is going to help to regulate your insulin levels and control your blood sugar. Once it gets even more serious, I'm going to start to give you insulin injections. Once it gets to even real levels of seriousness, where your kidneys may stop to function effectively, now I've got to do dialysis, right? So there are multiple degrees of interventions. Same exact thing with mental health, right? And then if we can start to detect and identify things at an early stage, even on ourselves first, right? There are different simple techniques, right? So, so many things that I can share, right? Like, um, you know, for example, one, one specific thing, right? Because, um, you know, some people talk about breathing exercises or not, but I don't know about you, Nick, but for me, when someone tells me to breathe, my problem is my brain is wandering all over. Like I just cannot switch off this brain, right? Just too many thoughts. So one exercise that has worked for me and it may or may not work for others is I need to give my brain homework. And so the thing about, you remember anxiety is thoughts about the future threat and depression is thoughts about the past threats. Sometimes all we need is the pause button and the equivalent to the pause button is engaging our senses. So five, four, three, two, one, right? If I tell you, Nick, right now, name five things that you can see around you, right? Well, you don't have to tell me now, right? Like, think about it, right? Four things that you can feel, that you can touch and feel, right? Sort of the, the clothes, the, the chair that you're sitting on, you know? Three things that you can hear, like my voice, maybe the air conditioning, two things that you can smell, right? And one thing that you can still taste in your mouth. That simple act, because once the brain is focused on those senses, it actually pauses the thoughts of the future and the thoughts of the past. And, and Nick, for those of you who are triathletes, right, what's the difference between running a triathlon and running a marathon? The running part of a triathlon and the running part of a marathon. What's the number one dis difference, Nick? Well, it definitely feels far harder. <laughs> okay, but what time do you start running when you're doing a triathlon? Midday. It, it's, Midday, it's, right? It's hot. <laughs> These guys running a marathon, they start before sunrise because, you know, they, they don't want the sun to disturb their complexion. Right? <laughs> but for triathletes, we got to swim and, and cycle first. So when we run, it's really hot. What do you do when it's really hot? You know what a lot of triathletes do? We look for shade, right? And you start to run underneath the, the, the tree shades because even in that two seconds where the sun stops beating on you, that relief counts. 
Because when you got 42 kilometers ahead of you, the two seconds of relief, the small pauses count for a lot, right? And that's exactly what 54321 does. Because if we can just pause for one minute, right, it actually stops it from amplifying and growing out of control. Now, those are just one example. There are many other things. There are kind of, you know, once it gets a bit more serious, when you need proper therapy, once it gets even more serious, where there is, there's sort of medication that's involved and any other medical procedures that are involved. So understanding different interventions at different degrees. But the sooner we can detect it, the easier it becomes to deal with it. And then it's like identifying a technique that best suits you, for example. So some people like the gym and like, you know, hit workouts. Some people like running. Um, right. Meditation, for example, that breathing, I, I know wouldn't work for me. So it's trying to identify what does work for me and, and, okay. stick, and, and experimenting and recognizing that some things work better than others. Um, and it's okay if what suits your friend doesn't suit you. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go into the uh, into the questions uh, now. Just before I do, um, let's just run the the second poll. So I'd be really interested to get this uh, this perspective before we, we answer the questions. So, um, does your employer have a structured employee program in place to address mental health and resilience? Yes, we also have methods for measuring success. Yes, but we have no method for measuring success. We're developing one, or not at present. And we'll just give you a. Uh, uh, a few moments to to answer yeah and a reminder for those of you who have questions but have not put that into the q a box please go ahead and do that now since we'll be addressing some of these questions live and some of you have also given thumbs up to questions that resonate with you so continue to do that as you uh, look at the questions coming in so all right i think i will stop the poll for now majority of you have voted and here are the results Ooh, wow so a lot more we can do. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And those results, you know, I, I don't think will come as a surprise to to, to yourself, Azran. They certainly don't come to a surprise to myself. You know, we're very good, and especially when we went when we moved into this working from from home environment, we were very good at you know driving productivity and making sure people are on. And you know, very quickly you realise that there are there are completely blurred lines between your home life and your work life, and just because you're working from home all the time bosses assume well you must be working all the time and employers always felt on so um it doesn't surprise me that, that, that these results and there's definitely a lot more that, that corporations can do to help their employee well-being but also to make it uh, um quantifiable because uh, i think that's the, the really important piece as well okay let's get into the uh, the first question so uh, the, the question that's got the most likes so far, um, how do we manage employees who seem to have the, uh, to, sorry, how do we manage employees who seem to have let their stress levels or anxiety impact their productivity and performance? Well, again, right, what are the tools and support systems that they have to manage it? Because clearly different people will have different triggers or causes of that stress and anxiety, and they're going to need help because otherwise, you know, it just keeps building up and you just kind of, keeps uh, the, the pressure keeps building up. What we've noticed, for example, in, in, in our work, especially in the last two months during this uh, movement control restriction, there are three classes of employees who are dealing with this. The first really just needs a place where they can call and vent. There's a lot of anger at, out there, right? especially um, companies where employees have to go out on the front lines or their bosses are at home, right? And so they're feeling, I'm taking a lot more risk and I'm being paid less, right? And so there's a lot of anger and frustration out there, right? And oftentimes for those people to be able to just articulate it, they tend to feel better after a 15 minute phone call. There's another bigger group where they're dealing with something that's behavioral, right? Like I'm losing sleep. I just cannot sleep. Like there's so many things happening to me. I keep waking up in the middle of the night, right? Um, I, I haven't been able to eat well. I've not been able to exercise because the gyms are closed. Right? And, and so they're struggling because their routines are disrupted. And that's where the digital behavioral coaching helps because someone is there to say, okay, let's focus on one thing that we're going to do for this week. I'm going to check up with you every two to three days. And over one to two months, they start to be able to turn that stress and anxiety into actions that they can take, right? Or even executive coaches helping them, for example, deal with a conflict with a, work, a worker, right? So rather than just letting it manifest, help them focus on, okay, what's the one thing I can do? and then learn from that and create that accountability. But there's a smaller, about a 10% group where that stress or anxiety is at a clinical level. 
by clinical level, that means it is a diagnosable level of depression or anxiety, and, and there, there are ways of diagnosing this. And once it becomes a medical condition, like you really need proper help, right? Like proper therapy sessions, or even in some cases, we've got to bring in a psychiatrist and, and treat, uh, treat it medically, because basically the, the hormonal systems have been out of balance, right? So the psychologist may help understand what those root causes or triggers are. The psychiatrist can help with some medical intervention. So different degrees of interventions to deal with different levels of stresses and anxieties. Okay, excellent. Um, let's move on to, to the next question. And I think this is a, a great question. So thank you for, for asking it. Um, as leaders, should we be transparent about our own stress levels um, to our teams? Uh, many feel the need to be uh, present themselves or sort of to present themselves as calm and composed. Um, and this, I think this comes back to your turbulence analogy about trying to remain calm. It must be hard, but Absolutely. I think that's a great question. Yeah, so first of all, right, uh, my basic premise in a, in a time of crisis is truth, right? Like we've got to be real with our team members, right? If we're going through a cash crunch, if things are looking bleak, if we may even have to have retrenchments in the pipeline, we've got to be open about it, right? But I think when it comes to kind of what you, you may want to figure out is how do I control uh, the emotions that I project, right? Because if suddenly you look like you are completely afraid and you have no idea what to do, that can also be demoralizing. So the first things we've got to do as a leader is how do I deal with my own fears, insecurities, and anxieties that happen, right? So for example, in my case, I have a structured peer support group with seven other CEOs, we meet eight times a year, right? Because we're peers, we understand the challenges that we do each other, but there's a specific protocol because if I can have my safe space to open up, I'm better able to deal with it. The problem we have as CEOs is I can't be vulnerable to my board and my shareholders because they might think differently about me. I can't do that to my subordinates. I can't do that to my business partners and suppliers. And so we just try to deal with it inside. And that's the single biggest problem when you just try to keep it inside of you. Okay. Um, next question, and again, a really, really good question. How do you manage, um, because you can't erase it, anxiety and depression from the past, whether it be family backgrounds, um, uh, and bring positives into the future? You know, the, um, the best example of this, personally for me, because I can really relate to it, is because, you know, when I start triathlons, I have a very deep-seated fear of swimming. Because I, you know, I don't know about you, Nick, but I grew up in the 1970s where there was not one, not two, but three movies called Jaws, right? And it left this like, like freaked out mark. So I was really deathly afraid of going into the sea because of the, the, the threat of potential sharks, right? Now, here's the thing, right? Like I had to get help to deal with that. And even today, right, after doing like 10, 12 Ironmans, there are certain things I have to do. There are certain things I have to say to myself when I get into the water. And when in the water, when, when that feeling, that, that sort of like panic starts to kick in, I now know there are certain things I have to do, right? So I then start going into a checklist. But here's the thing. Even as early as February, you remember there's a Port Dixon triathlon, right? Right before the movement control order, I panicked during that swim. So the fear never goes away. That anxiety never goes away. It's still there. But I am now equipped with a checklist of things I need to do when that happens. And that is the difference between if you don't have that toolkit, right, you let that feeling of anxiety kind of really take over and, and it really impairs our ability to function. But those are the kinds of trainings that psychologists or counselors work with people who are wrestling with this so that they can at least have things to do. Once you focus on action, your brain kind of doesn't think so much about the, the anxiety uh, video playing, uh, you know, kind of that loop going nonstop. So next time I see you in a, in a triathlon, just beforehand, I'm going I'm, I'm to start humming the Jaws theme tune oh, just to give myself a little bit of an edge over you. <laughs> that would freak me out. But I think, um, I think some people would, would have some very deeply ingrained um, uh, uh, challenges. And, and, and you know, the environment is so, so important to, uh, to your, your, your mental state. And that's from when you're born right the way through up to present day. And, um, and I think first and foremost, talking about what those um challenges are that you have and um you know what those you know what is it that makes that anxiety come to the surface and then talking about it first is a really really important first step and then yeah. just understanding that it's okay to have those um the, the, those anxious moments and what have you um and then seeking the right help to to give you those tools to, to be able to uh to be able to deal with it 
Right. Um, so uh, we've got time for a few, few more questions. So, um, uh, and the next question is actually about environment as well, which is great. So emotion and stress level uh, are highly influenced by the environment or surrounding. So how do you deal with um, people who are always negative? Sure. So actually within part of the digital coaching, we actually have this like mini four, four week, five week resilience curriculum, right? So by first identifying people who kind of really need help, right? We teach them things like mindsets and motivations, because the first thing you've got to be clear is what is your mindset and what's your motivation to deal with this challenging environment or negative people, right? How do I deal with difficult communications, right? How do I um, give feedback more constructively? How do I receive feedback and not feel defensive, right? How do I be more aware of my thinking traps? Because sometimes you might perceive someone who's critical of you as they're judging me, right? They're being very negative, but there are ways that we can kind of teach people, well, how do we validate that? What's the motivation behind their criticism, right? And then under teaching trust, right? Like what is the foundation for relationships and trust? And finally learning how to cope with setbacks and failure. So specific tools so that in any situation, I have like, okay, these are the three things I'm gonna do, right? So at least you put, put it into action rather than just letting that anxiety percolate and just go around in circles. Yeah, because that, that individual's anxiety or negativity must come from somewhere. Um, and I suppose it's also, you know, going back to that individual and just trying to understand, well, where, where does this negativity come from and what can we do to help alleviate some of that negativity? And it may be something very, very simple. Absolutely. Yeah. But if you don't, if you don't ask, you'll, you'll, you'll not find out. Um, uh, okay, and I think, uh, TK, thank you for, for this question, because I think this is, this is, this is critical. Um, I think many people are afraid to go and you know, seek help uh, because they think they have a, a mental problem. Um, what can we do as leaders to encourage people to focus on their, their mental health without being, being stigmatized? Um, Absolutely. Uh, great question. And, and that, that's the primary motivation for Nellery, right? Because mm -hmm. what can we do to address that stigma? And so digital was one way of doing that, right? Because if you're told, look, whenever you're ready, download the app, you can reach help immediately, right? Whenever you're ready, call, and no one needs to know that you're getting help, number one. Number two, we tend to focus on this as a, an integrated health program. It's not a mental health program because we also talk about diet and exercise and uh, you know, physical health, and we take measurements like weight, blood pressure, blood sugar, so that there's not stigma that this is a specifically a mental health program. Right? But the single biggest thing that has worked well is when CEOs and heads of department keep talking about it, right? keep saying, guys, this is a resource for you. This is being run by a third party organization. So we don't see data. We only see like aggregate data, right? 27% of employees reached out. And you know, these are the kind of broad categories of, of issues that reach out, but we don't know who's bringing up what kind of issue. And when leaders stick up, right? some of them have recorded videos so that their employees know that the CEO says, I'm providing these resources for you. I'm using the resource myself because I know I need to get more mentally resilient for all of us to get through this difficult situation. And so when you lead by example, that's one of the most powerful ways of dealing with that stigma. Absolutely, because as, as leaders, you're, you're, you're not an, um, immune to, uh, to, to, to mental well-being uh, and what have you. And I think you're right, talking about it first and foremost is really important. Um, and I think we'll see a, a, a big shift in um, mental illness being spoken about and taught a lot more at school because at the moment clearly it isn't. Um, so most of us just have a lack of understanding uh, around it. And as we said at the start, you know, stigma is caused through prejudice and prejudice is through a lack of information. So if we can provide that education at an earlier, um, earlier age, then hopefully that'll help remove some of that, that, that stigma as well moving forward. Great question, TK. Thank you. Um, a question here from, uh, from, from Haida. So some people perform better in a stressful situation, um, difficult and challenging situation. Um, shall we create stress in order to drive them? Well, remember my, my point about stress and skill, right? So yes, absolutely the right level of stress. In fact, there is a technical word for it. It is called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, mm. which is positive stress as opposed to distress, which is negative stress. So yeah. creating positive stress is important to be able to rise to the occasion and perform at our best. But you need to have the skills and the tools to cope with it, right? So when I'm feeling my heart beating faster, my blood pressure rising, my muscles 
uh, tensing up, I know this is not fear, right? This is I'm prime and ready for action. And so there's sort of mental tools to equip our team members to channel that stress positively. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Really, really good question again. Um, there's another question here, and I think we've probably got time for, for, for one more. Um, how can you identify or measure your own emotions or stress level um, and how to manage it? Well, um, you know, what, there, there are two things. One is screening and one is diagnosis. So what we do online is a simple screening tool. It's a 21 question, multiple choice question that is clinically validated in all the Asian languages, right? So that we, we kind of can interpret the data much more objectively. But like, like I showed you earlier, it gives you a depression score, an anxiety score, and a stress score. Now, that's not a diagnosis, but at least screens to say, look, this bottom 10% probably really needs help, right? And that's where we can then channel the, the psychologist to kind of come in and do a, a proper diagnosis on the severity levels. And there are different clinical assessments that we can apply to really say, is someone going through normal depression and anxiety and they can self-regulate in two or three days, or they're going through clinical depression and anxiety and they need structured help. And is it fair to say that um, yeah, there's an element of self-reflection in here as, as well? Um, uh, you know, mid last week, I remember one day, it, you know, just had one of those bad days. It just, just wasn't a great day. Um, and even, you know, a, a colleague said, oh, you know, everything okay, you're just stressed. And I just sort of played it down. No, no, everything's fine. Um, but I remember thinking about it later that evening. And the reality is when I thought about that day, you know, I hadn't exercised that day. I had a bad night's sleep. But, you know, I didn't eat breakfast when I normally would do. Uh, and all those things may seem very minimal in their own right, but they all contribute into your overall well-being. So just listening to yourself and understanding what works for you is really, really important. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I think look, look, the last question I'd like to finish with, um, Azran, again, I think it's a really important one. I'd love to hear your thoughts is, you know, what message would, would you have to anyone who is hesitant to, to seek help, um, seek help um, uh, when they know they probably really need it? Well, think, think about it this way, right? Like the, the best performers in the world have the luxury of support and help. None of us, we're humans, we're social creatures, right? So trying to solve anything on our own is never a great strategy. It's just like you don't want to go to court and defend yourself, right? Like you want a good lawyer next to you, right? So same exact principle, because when you can get good professional help that is non-judgmental, that creates a safe space and focuses on our action, then we, we can turn what may be normal levels of stress, anxiety, depression into something actionable that leads to a more positive situation. And so there, today there are more and more tools so that you can do that completely on your own, you can do that completely anonymously, um, you know, and basically get help rather than just let it fester and grow uh, untreated. Excellent, thank you. Um, Azran, many thanks for sharing your thoughts today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it, it's certainly a, a topic that I've got a really keen interest in, and you know, I'm delighted to see the work Mallory doing. Um, if, if there is anyone on, the, on, on the, the webinar today that would like to sort of find out more, um, how best can they get in contact with your, yourself and, and the, the Nallory team? Probably the, the best way is either I'm on LinkedIn, or if you search Nallory on Google, you should be able to find us. Good stuff. Great stuff. And, and if there is one out there that, that, that would like to, um, to get in contact, um, please do. Um, it's a really important topic. And the more we all talk, talk about it, um, the less stigma associated. So many thanks for all joining. It's been a, it's been a great session. The, the hour has flown by and we could probably talk for, for, for longer. I know I certainly could. But thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everyone.